Five years ago, I got the world's best research grant in the place I work in Catalonia in Spain. Why is it the world's best research grant? Because it's individual, it's not for a team, uh, because it's for the project that I propose, it's not on any preset thing, and it gets me out of teaching. <coughs> that is, for five years, I've had money to pay someone to teach my classes and to pay for a research assistant, and I have a few other assistants around the place. Dreamland for researchers. Now, just imagine you're there. What would you do? What would you really like to do research on? What do you really want to know? Just think about it, okay? Now, I had learnt from colleagues in what we call them, the exact sciences, that you always present the project for the one you've already done. Uh, so I've, I've worked on, on technology, translation and technology. I knew I had results there. I presented a project on translation and technology knowing full well I'd already done it. So I can guarantee results. This is what they do in the sciences. And you buy time to think, which is what I did. I had, well, two years to really think about what I want to do. And of course, I wasted the first, wasted. I spent the first year reading the texts I pretended to have read. You know that list you've got? <laughs> like you really should go back and read that one, but it's hard. And, uh, so I, I you know, spent a year going through Kant, uh, um, Habermas, uh, Popper was important, I've been writing on, on scientific methodology, uh, and things like that. I'm just naming the Germanic men who are dead uh, to show the respect I have for your cultures. <laughs> Uh, and little by little, it, it uh, came to crystallize, uh, to my mind at least, that the, the aspect of cross-cultural communication we know least about is the reception side. I find plenty of assumptions about what will happen if we translate like this, it'll be good for our cultures. If we translate like that, it'll be bad for our cultures. My, my, my. Our colleague, Lawrence Renuti, sort of proposes that a foreignizing translation will open the United States to cultural alterity. All right, that's a good hypothesis. I would love to test that and see if it works, for example. And there are many other suppositions about the consequences of what we do as mediators, but very little research. And the research that exists is disheartening. Why? because you find that you only get different receptions when you get radically different translations, as in extreme adaptation, opposed to extreme literalism, density, hard to read. And you don't know what you're measuring, the, the, the difficulty of reading, of a certain way of writing, or the actual translation process. And then the vast majority of the empirical research projects that are out there including those on conference interpreting, um, find no significant difference or find that the subject variation, that the people, the way people receive messages cross-culturally depends so much on their individual circumstances. It's very difficult to get any firm hypothesis proved uh, regarding the way translation or interpreting is done. For example, they tried it when the interp conference interpreters did not want to use remote interpreting. There's massive resistance to that. They did experiments to, to see the consequences of remote interpreting. Uh, the first studies that were published showed no significant difference. The later studies, I haven't read the results. I don't know if they ever got published. Okay, uh, So it's not giving us the results we want. I mean... Just imagine if it's shown that a bad translation is received just as well as a good translation as far as we're concerned, good and bad. Why should we be training people to do good translations? It's dangerous research, don't they? Okay, now I wasn't getting far on that level. And we've, been, we've done a few things. I'm not going to show you them because they're not really there, but we've got an eye tracker where we are doing, we are watching what people uh, 
find as problematic when they process cross-cultural communication in general. But my, my attack has been quite different. Uh, I've moved to the other level. If the empirical, the very close empirical stuff, or the kind of stuff that Hannah was showing us, was it two weeks ago, you know, the interviews of the micro situation, if that's not giving you anything helpful, it's giving you a lot of information, but what do you do with it? Uh, let's move to the other level, to the idealistic level. And I start to think along these lines. Well, what kind of cross-cultural communication would I like to see? What would be an aim of cross-cultural communication? And let's work back from there and see if we can find traces of it. Okay? Interesting question. A broad ethical question. Highly political question as well. And, uh, and quite taxing for me. I mean, at the beginning, I had no answers for that question. It was a frightening question. Perhaps you'd like to answer it for yourselves. How would you answer that? From the answers there, you can try to say what kind of information we should give cross-culturally. But then I came to realize that information is not what it's all about. And then, uh, following off on those kinds of ethical should questions, what kind of work, what kind of research do we do? And uh, most of my research um, in, in this, on this side of business has been on translation history, so I, I'm going to talk about how we can write translation history from the perspective of reception and from answers to those questions. Okay, so very briefly, the menu is that I'm going to show you three different projects, none of them complete, but all of them suggestive, and you could perhaps help me with uh, getting to the end of them, uh, making some kind of coherent conclusion. My first thought, what kind of cross-cultural communication do we want, is that there should be some sense of aspiration. That there are messages that can be transmitted across cultures which are used by the people who receive them in order not just to change the social systems or their own personal well-being, to change the life around them, but can give them a reason to do it. That's what I mean by aspiration. Okay? This is the non-information side of a message. You get information, but what's missing in a lot of messages is the, the spark. You know, I really want to go and do something with this. That aspiration. Now, I, just force of circumstance, I came across a group of students at my university from Syria. And this was, let's see, three years ago, uh, when it wasn't quite the quagmire in civil war that it is now. It was the beginning of what seemed to be a terminable civil war. And, and uh, these people were there uh, talking about their hope for their country and the hope in a post-Assad uh, era. I don't think they talk the same way now. Uh, and I interviewed them. And I'd never done interviews, in-depth interviews as a research technique before, but my one aim was to get them talking about them growing up. Uh, primary school, secondary school, university, family. And I was working on the hypothesis that these people were multilingual. They had Arabic, English, and French to varying degrees, and one girl had Greek and another Armenian, I think. Uh, and I was betting that people who have these different cultural spaces use them to get leverage. You can use the information coming into you in French and English to criticize or get a critical distance with respect to the totalitarian regime they were brought up in. And they, they really were brought up in a closed system. They're, it's, you know, these girls, the three that I'm going to talk about, were all women. Uh, they were all in the, I don't know, it's not the Hitler Jugend, but something similar. They all learned to fire machine guns. You know, there's something quite sexy about this militant, you know, 
They were all brought up to be believers and in the cons conspiracy theories against us. You know, people who don't believe in the Assad ideology, it's conspiracies, and you've got the narratives to block that out. And they were very much in it when they go through primary school, early secondary school, and then the cracks start to show. And I was interested in where did the cracks come from? Where do these messages come in from the outside if you're in a closed regime? I, I naively thought that it might be their course in French literature or something like that, or the English class, or being able to get access to films in other languages, or uh, cultural products from another place and time. Do you know what the only common feature was? Especially these three, but uh, others as well. It wasn't that. It wasn't the languages. It wasn't the cultural space or the cultural products. None of that had changed their ideology. In all cases, they mentioned one person. Just one person. Just talking with that one person. It could have been an uncle. It could have been an English teacher. It could have been a university professor. It could have been a colleague who had lived away and came back. Okay, there are different people. There's no recipe for it. But the aspiration, which then became a critical view of where they were, came from one-on-one -on -one contact. You know, Professor Dizdar talked about cultural technologies and the power I'll talk about statues in a minute as a cultural technology. Or the power of the written, which we had this morning, uh, that official culture of power, Herrschaft, you know, dominance, works through written communication. The most powerful was spoken person-to-person -person communication. As any evangelist priest could have told them, had I asked them. Uh, this started me reading as... Others of my generation are doing. We, we go back and read Badiou. Uh, <coughs> Badiou. I find that hard to put up. B a d i o u. Uh, radical leftist Marxists who had been there even when I was a student in Paris, but suddenly Americans and Italians had picked him up and started to talk about the event, the communication event, the event that makes people believe in something, even though there's no rational basis for it. And of course, the great master of this was Paul, you know, a saint for some, this mad man, really mad, you know, really suffering, uh, epileptic, uh, the, the vision on the road to Damascus, and things like that, uh, managed to inspire people all across the Mediterranean simply by talking to them, and it's true, writing letters to them, which are in our Bible. Not a great translator, I think. I did the same thing a bit later in South Africa uh, with a, an older generation, people who had been brought up under apartheid. And there I was interested in other things. Uh, they were at the lingual spaces as well. Uh, once again, that didn't prove to be a factor. I was interested, especially if uh, the, the long-term boycott against apartheid had changed their ideas. Uh, one uh, person said it had when she was in England, when she got out and saw her country, saw the boycott from the other side. But the people who grew up within the totalitarian explanation of the world, um, the boycott had no effect at all on, them, on, their, on their vision of what was true and what was false. Uh, th that's a long discussion. I could get into that as well. Um, in another place, not, not particularly here. Uh, there again, the critical view came from person-to-person -person contact. There it could be with a traveler, with a voyager, with an intermediary, uh, or it could be uh, with one of the Bantu population that they were in contact with uh, in, in the whole environment. So it's, it's rather more complex in that situation. It was being able to see their own cultural position from another perspective, either from the outside or from the repressed within. Uh, in that case, there is an element of translation happening there. I'll move on, I think. 
Uh, I'm just going to pick up the, the thing I've got from those interviews and from that stage of the research is that information is not going to do it. Uh, a lot of the translations that we do, the translation regime we live in, in the European Union especially, is based on people getting the information. Translate it accurately. Give it clearly. And yes, that's what we do, and we do it very well in Europe. But give us aspiration to change our lives or use cross-cultural communication to spread a sense of democratic participation. What I've written there is modernity. It's still modernity that the rest of the world is looking for, I think. Uh, no, that's not in our thinking about what cross-cultural communication is or should be. But it is in some parts of the translation world. And I've, I'll give you some examples here. This is from a doctoral thesis done by Beatrice Cortabaria. She's doing it now as I, as we speak. And um, she's looking at hospital communication. People here have looked at the same, the same kinds of events. And she's actually working on the problems of Spanglish, of the position of Spanish in the United States. But lots more is coming out. And I'm finding lots here that is of interest to me. Because the interpreters don't just give information. Okay? You, does anybody know Spanish? How do, you, how do you translate that, please? He's intoxicated. Sorry? Yeah. Yeah, you've read that article. <laughs> okay. No, it's quite a, a, a famous case. It's fine. Yeah, that's cheap. That's cheap. There's quite a famous case. It's just about the different varieties of Spanish that are there. Nor in current Spanish, the kind I would speak in Spain, intoxicado means you're drunk. Okay, so a guy gets brought into a hospital in, in Florida, somewhere down there, and the family the doctor says, What's wrong? And they say, Intoxicado, interpreter, he's drunk. Oh, leave him over there to sober up, which is what you do, of course. Uh, in Cuban Spanish, it means food poisoning, all right? So absolute wrong, wrong interpretation, wrong diagnosis. The guy dies, you pay millions of dollars, and you learn that uh, mistakes in this field can cost a lot of money, uh, not to mention death. It's an extreme case, okay, just to underline the point of varieties of Spanish. But when you go through it, uh, the way people, especially in the United States, are thinking about having that kind of problem has to do with what they call literacy. I think literacy means too many things for me. So I'm, I'm going to call this informed choice. Okay? But literacy, literacy in this field means the degree to which individuals have the capacity to obtain, process, and understand the basic information and services needed to make appropriate health decisions. Okay. Now, what's interesting in the example I gave you was that it was one-way communication. Doctor asks what's wrong, receives wrong information, doctor makes choice. Okay. There's not a dialogue, there's no feedback, there's no checking on it, there's no one saying, hey, but there's something inside him and it's not doing him any good. All right. There's a uh, one-two communication, that's it, it's done, the doctor's made the choice. Uh, thinking about health services in many countries uh, these days is about giving people the responsibility to make choices about what happens with their bodies. And this you can see in this definition. I'm not sure I'm very happy about it being rendered as Gesundheitskompetenz, but that seems to be the official uh, <coughs> translation. So, Dr. Perkhacker tells me. Okay, now... Uh, literacy in the United States is very much associated with immigrants and making sure they speak English. This is a popular topic and you can get money for it. So programs in literacy are abundant in American universities. Uh, I was recently at Ohio State University where what you and I would call modern languages is literacy. Why? Against money, because nobody could be against literacy. All right? 
and it's going to make sure that these immigrants use the language anyway. Uh, this idea of health literacy is, is, in a way, cashing in on this, but doing something a little bit trickier. Uh, they're detaching literacy from the ability to read and write, and they're attaching it to ability to make decisions. And that's, I think, is a very astute ideological move, especially if you can keep getting the farming while it's happening. The way the term is being used here, it's from Australia, the Victorian Australia. You'll see that it's not dependent on um, knowledge of a language system. It's, it's, it's something quite different from um, language competence, if you like. So they're reporting here, only 33% of the people born overseas have adequate or better health literacy compared to 43%, 33, 43, okay, of the Australian born population. So the people born in Australia who speak English and have always spoken English, of them, only 43% of them know how to make decisions about their body, about their health, at least, okay? And that goes down to 33% for uh, immigrants, but then you get people who've arrived in the last uh, five years, is it, to 26, and then down, uh, 27 and then 26. I find this intriguing because it's very clear that uh, the capacity to make informed decisions is something that's wanting, that's missing in L1 speakers and L2 speakers, and is simply more extreme in the case of other people who might need language help. So if interpreters enter at the 26, you know, the, the recent immigrants, the people who need the language help, uh, they're providing services that are rather similar to what the other people might like to get as well. But you see what I'm getting at? What happens is that the mediator is assuming not just responsibility for making up a language gap, but also an education gap, an information gap. That is existing in the general population as well. It combines, if you will, the mediational task we're used to with a clear pedagogical function. Now you can see this happening in some of the data done in hospitals. Um, I collected this data uh, thanks to this guy. Can you see him there? The, this is Eric Pickles. I could make lots of jokes about his name, but <coughs> there's, there's no time. Imagine them, all right? Uh, Eric is Minister for Community Services or something like that in, in England, UK government. Here we go. And he says, if you translate for immigrants, they will not learn English. No, it's, my mum says, yeah, that's right. This makes sense, doesn't it? Because if you get translation all the time, you're not going to learn. That is true. Would you learn a language if you're getting translations all the time? So on the surface of it, it's impeccable. It's a kind of logic people would vote for. The text goes on. Stopping the automatic use of translation and interpretation services into foreign languages will provide further incentive for all migrant communities to learn English, which is the basis for an individual's ability to progress in richer society. It will promote cohesion and better community relations. Not interpreting will create cohesion and better community relations. And it will help councils make sensible savings at a time when every bit of the public sector needs to do its bit to pay off the deficit. All right, now, the first bit, the argument about the cause and effect, is pretty easy to undo. Uh, I get data, for example, there's a study done on the Iraqi community in Melbourne, and you look at who the interpreters are. The interpreters are the immigrants who came in with the first generation. I mean, the community is interpreting for itself. How can they do that if they don't learn English? Obviously, they learn English. Uh, you can look at all the communicative events for which interpreting services are available, and it's a very small percentage. Interpreters are expensive. People have to use English because interpreting services never cover their full uh, needs in, 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 in daily life. Okay, and so on. You could question that. 
What's interesting for me, though, is that the... Because um, you see this concerns reception. How do people receive translations? Uh, they rely on them? No, they don't rely on them at all. They use them in many different ways. They use them to get information that can then save money. So there are studies, and this is a big study, over 3,000 patients, which show that when uh, people coming into hospital don't get interpreting services on admission and when they go out, when they're told what medicine to take and how long to take it, and uh, when they don't get interpreting services, they stay longer in hospital and they come back to hospital sooner. Put the other way, when the interpreters are supplied, the stay in hospital is shorter and the return rate is less. And the system saves money. And I want to go to Mr. Peoples and say, Eric, hey, you were worried about the budget. Look, use interpreters and you save money in your national health system. Easy argument. But it does concern his, his facile association of translation here, language learning there, as if they were two separate things. Now, there is a lot of research on that topic, especially in the United States where hospitals are exorbitantly expensive. Okay? Now, not all of it proves what I just explained. Where interpreters are overused or used indiscriminately or used to replace doctors who want to experiment with their bad Spanish, the results are not that. It does prove to be a real cost. Uh, so the trick is knowing when to use the interpreters, to use them in the situations when they're really needed, and to use them in a way in which the people can progress without interpreters in other situations. That is, the interpreters take on a pedagogical role. Just as a teacher teaches you knowledge that you can then go and use in other non-pedagogical situations. Uh, there is little sign of the user's dependency on mediation services. There are many signs of people using a bit of mediation, getting semiotic resources that they can then apply in other places. Uh, this is from my doctoral students. <coughs> Research, doctor, have they done an endoscopy? I, I know nothing about this stuff, but interpreter, and and this dentro con una camera. Did they get a camera and look inside you? Well, what's happened? The patient can answer that one because you remember, hey, they got that camera, they put that inside, uh, and the patient has learnt the word, the English word. Okay, she's got the meaning, she's got the word. Next time somebody talks about endo endoscopy in Spanish or in English, she will have that knowledge. It's a little piece of knowledge, but if people are putting cameras inside you, it might be useful. <laughs> do you have incontinence, says the doctor. Interpreter says, do you have incontinence problems or wetting? Just in case that word incompetent, incompetence, incontinence is difficult for you, here is what it means. You see what I mean? It's a pedagogical along with the mediation in terms of information. Where do I pay the taxes? Where do you pay taxes? In questions. Donde pago las tasas? Okay. Uh, interpreter. Donde paga los impuestos? The interpreter here is correcting the patient. Okay. And giving the patient the word they need in future uh, for that particular situation. In some varieties of Spanish, uh, your taxes are impuestos. In my variety, they are. In others, it's taxes. Okay. Is the wound going to stop leaking? Uh, asks the patient, and the interpreter replies directly, el drenaje, the drainage. Say, look, hey, drenaje is the word you're going to need here in future. And when you hear drainage, it means drenaje, and it means leaking. All right? So the interpreter is here, subsuming the role of the, uh, of the doctor, which is perhaps not ethically good in some places, but also teaching the patient how to understand what's going on in this discursive environment. 
uh, the interpreters in the United States using Spanish will have lots of English there. Because they don't know Spanish? No. Because terms don't exist in Spanish? Sometimes, but not always. Often it's just giving them the terms they'll need to understand what's happening in the hospital. Down syndrome is Down syndrome. Uh, okay. Cystic fibrosis is muy común. All right, that's fair enough. Okay, and the TAP, uh, you could reverse the letters to get the Spanish uh, abbreviation, but it's easier and quicker for everybody just to use the English, and that way they all understand each other. Spanish language is uh, not unhappy for the specialists of the Real Academia, but the hospitals seem to work pretty well. Okay? And the people learn to survive and make decisions about their own health in a multilingual environment. What's happening here is very much what Jan Lomit talks about when he refers to uh, a postmodern world in which people pick up semiotic resources. We don't learn our language, or we, we do, whether we're, we're the media is, okay, but many of the people out there pick up bits <coughs> and pieces of language and put it together to make do, to understand what's happening, to travel, to enhance the mobility, and to uh, communicate to the degree that they need it. Okay? And you can see the interpreters there playing that game as well. They can provide more information. They can provide a perfectly acceptable uh, standard Spanish uh, rendition or standard English, but they're doing more than that. They are teaching people uh, the, inf the information that they will need. My reflections from there that's about information. I mean, it's, it's interesting what's happening in that information side. And to connect that information <coughs> side with the aspiration side is the kind of thing I'm interested in now. I'm really interested if that idea of informed choice, giving people the information they need to make a choice, but also, is it aspiration? empowering them, making them feel that they have the right to make that choice. Okay, They have to take the courage to make that choice as well. It's not just, here's the information you decide. It's giving them, um, making them feel capable of deciding for themselves. Can that model be transferred from the healthcare domain to the legal system? <laughs> Probably so, since it's written into the way accused um, Inter interact with, with lawyers and with uh, officers of the court. But what about bureaucracy, dealing with government websites, uh, where there's still the idea of um, full translation is too expensive, so we're not going to do it, but often a little bit of translating can do a lot of good uh, and get, get people on their way. Or uh, you can encourage people, I'm very interested in, in giving people basic classes, in how to work with free online machine translation. Google Translate. Uh, so many people out there are using it as if it was a translation. They're not knowing the difference because they don't know what's in that target language in many cases. But you can give them some easy tricks, you know, back translation or comparing it with parallel websites or just a little bit of post editing and improve their use of translation in non professional environments. Would help. Okay. Good. I'll just leave the rest. I'll just that's the last one. The economic banking literacy. I, I opened a bank account just down the road here, at the Esther Bank, and I got that form. Sorry, that's page one of it. You can't read it. I can't read it either. Not even when I've got it in front of me. I had eight pages <coughs> of the finest of fine print, saying sign at the end. Help. What are they doing to me? Okay, I trusted the bank and I trusted the person who took me to the bank, I guess. But this is the opposite from any kind of empowering literacy or information to decide. Here is what we're going to do. Uh, is this what you want, yes or no? Uh, this belongs to a bygone, bygone age. A lot of the translations I've done for the institutions of the European Union are pretty much like that. You know, I used to do these meetings of, you know, 
minutes of meetings three, that happened three months ago, and it has to be put into English because that's what the rules say, but everybody there was speaking their own language and, and were quite happy. Financial meetings, for example, uh, where they're speaking bad English and they understand a bit of bad French, and it, they, they understood each other. doesn't matter. I used to get this. I have to put it into clean English because some law says so. And then it's put on a file somewhere. I think that's called existential translation. It's virtuous because it exists, not because it communicates with anyone. So my question is, is that just for health? And can I ally that information-based kind of ethics with the aspiration-based ethics? I think I have to. I think I need both. If I've just got the event, as some of my colleagues would like translation to, 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 to be investigated, make it exciting, make it an event, get people involved in it, I still do see these images of the Nuremberg rally and the Hitler movement and the, the power of the event to move people beyond reason. Uh, there is still, there should be in these cultures around us in Europe, enough of a warning there to say, hey, wait a minute, that aspiration, that event can't be all. There has to be an element of information and clear information that people can then use to make decisions for themselves. There cannot be this getting lost in the multitudinous nationalism. I have a lot of time for people who work on political literacy in this sense. And a lot of times for Habermas's aim that in a democracy, people should be able to view themselves jointly as authors of the law. That is, it's not the law is not something that somebody sends to me or uses to control me. I am partly the author of that law because I participated in the process by which it was generated. It's a logical thing if you think about what democracy is, but by gee, that's hard to apply in anything like a multilingual democracy such as we have in Europe. However, that is very much the aim that I would like to go towards politically. Should I stop there, or do you want a third thing? I, I, do you want 10 more minutes on history? They said yes, but it's hot in here. Should I open the door or something? Or? We'll go quickly. Okay, um, this I, I just mentioned it because it came out of Dilek uh, Pizda's talk here, and afterwards I was talking about uh, the relations between my country and hers, uh, between Australia and Turkey, uh, and there was the centenary of an armed conflict where 10,000 Australians got shot on a beach in Turkey, and uh, we believe that made us a nation. It's a stupid thing to believe, but that's the way it goes. And it had been entirely hidden from me that in that same conflict, 85,000 Turks got killed. The First World War was just a bloodbath. It's, it's a shocking thing. Now, it, it concerns this sentence here, which is attributed to Ataturk. Ataturk was one of the commanders of that conflict called Gallipoli, uh, in English, and he is said to have uh, written these words in, in 1934, speaking about the remains of the soldiers at that conflict. Uh, there is no difference between the Johnnies and the Mehmets to us. Mehmets is a common Turkish name, for uh, the common given name in Turkey, and it's the soldiers, the general enlisted, the the pride gun, the GI gun. Uh, there's no difference where they lie side by side in this country of ours. And um, that statement has been picked up in Australia and put on monuments. So I was going to talk about cultural technologies. We have the ephemeral of the 101 spoken communication and then the permanence of a bronze plaque. This is in Brisbane in Queensland where you have those words. Unfortunately, you can't see it there, but the date is 1931. 
and they spelt Ataturk's first name as Camel instead of Kamal. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you don't want to make mistakes on your monument. Okay, they had to, had to fix that one up. That was 1978. Okay, there you, you can see the 1931, perhaps. Uh, this is a monument in Canberra with the same words and uh, the image of Ataturk. Uh, Anzac Gove. And in New Zealand, Anzac means Australian and New Zealanders. They were also getting slaughtered in the same event. So there are at least three statues, or three and a half around the world, that have these words uh, put on them. And it, what interests me in them is that this is, um, they are seen by many people, many commentators, Western commentators, as I think the, the excellent journalist Robert Fisk says the most magnanimous words uh, spoken by a Muslim leader. You know, it's quite something to say that after so much slaughter, they are equal, they are sons. He uses the term sons, they are our sons. This historian in Turkey comes out and says, ah, he never said it. Ah. And he wrote an article where he goes and proves painstakingly that Australians were always bad translators. <laughs> At which point of oh, man. No, no, it, actually, it, it's the opposite. When I first came across the article, it's, it's been translated into English, I thought, yes, of course. I mean, I am so anti-nationalist, so much against official history, that my initial reaction was, at last, somebody's revealed how we falsify our history. Okay. I and others, Australian historians of the left, have picked up this and say, look, we've been falsifying relations with the Turks. Okay. And then I got down to actually doing the translation analysis. All the historians talk about this falsification. Did he say it? Did he not? And they trace the events, his presence, where was he, who wrote it down, etc. They never asked what language did he say it in, if it was in Turkish, how did it get into English? Who translated it? And why did they translate it? Okay, it's just a missing question. Translation is not there. We can't talk about the text as it was originally because we don't know where it was produced, but we do have a Turkish version which sounds like the Turkish of Ataturk and sounds right for 1934. My informants tell me. Okay, and I've underlined the phrase there. You can see Mehmet, but you can't see a Johnny, right? And in fact, uh, Johnny's out there. You've got the blow-by-blow uh, uh, -blow analysis here. You are on the Turkish name Google with side-by-side, -side, and there it is. So what's happened is a translator somewhere has put in a Johnny. How dare they? Now, who the translator was, I don't know. It could have been the Australian sheep farmer who, who had that horrible first monument done with the, with the pluck. Okay, he was a sheep farmer. It could have been a, a Turkish primary school teacher who met an Australian there and showed him a guidebook with these words in it. Or it could have been a professional interpreter employed by the sheep farmer. It was, we don't know, okay? <coughs> but if I look at it as a translator, how am I going to tell people in Australia what Mehmet means? Yeah, not a clue. Mehmet is a common word for a Turkish soldier. If I put Johnny's and Mehmet, I understand. It tells me, Johnny's tells me, Mehmet is a name like Johnny. It's a, a term of endearment as well. You've got the diminutive, kick, expressing affection. Okay? Uh, and the, and the last verse, uh, it sounds horrible, doesn't it? They're bracing each other, but my, my informant said, it's like little kids cuddling up. It's a horrible image for dead soldiers. In the field. But, uh, <laughs> but, you know, the, the whole thing is all like that, going in that sense. And it occurred to me that that addition of Johnny's was a very elegant solution to a very difficult problem. The, the alternative would have been just to put young soldiers which is not going to move anybody. Okay, this creates something that's moving and informative at the same time. 
the translator had reasons. I'm not going to say it's the best translation in the world, but if you look at it as a translator, it is motivated. It wasn't, I think, designed to falsify anything. They've added Johnny's, they added the phrase no difference and to us, but at the end of the passage, it says they are all our sons. And all of us know that our children are all loved equally, officially. If your parents, you'll know that you prefer one or the other, but you never tell them and you can't pronounce them. Okay. Now, the Turkish historian, it's a bit like that. He says, how could our great leader have loved dead Australian and New Zealand soldiers as much as Turkish soldiers? He couldn't have, therefore he never wrote it. But if you've been a parent, you know there are some things you have to say publicly. And a valid publicly as well. Now, my research on this um, has got to the point where I think I can justify that translation and the other bad translations that were accused of <coughs> uh, by poor Australian translators. But you've got to put it in a situation of reception. Okay, People are arguing about production and intention. It's never about that. We don't know. We don't have production and intention. If it was pronounced in 1934, it was at Gallipoli, next to a monument, looking at war graves, which were for the Allied invaders and not for the Turks, because the Turks did not believe in giving graves to fallen soldiers. They left them in the field, as had been done in all previous wars prior to the First World War, you have to see the, the film, The Water Diviner, to know this, because they talk about this. Okay, Now, he is saying to them, leave them there where they lie. In that situation, he is saying, and he has a 1931 speech where he says, let there be no more monuments. We don't want any more monuments. Their sacrifice is monument enough. Let us look to the future and not to the past. <coughs> No, it wasn't. That was a good speech as well. Okay. Now, I think here, in the 1930s, the, the exact same words mean something different. Leave her in the ground. I wonder if this is going to work. This is from the film I just mentioned. Here are the Australians coming along. Russell Crowe. He looks over. And all those bones there, I think you could just see on the side of the screen in the next shot, say, Turkish bones. And the Australian soldier is secretly quite happy about that. Uh, and what that whole scene shows is that uh, the Australians are locating and identifying bodies and giving them graves. And when they come across Turkish bones, they are merely discarded. So, at a Turk, I'm pretty sure. We're saying, stop this folly. Don't do that. Just leave it and get on with the business of, of building our societies. Uh, well, we're doing that. But a sentence transported out of its situation of utterance, a sentence that gains that kind of transcendence, that's what I mean by transcendence, it's picked up out of situation of utterance and taken to another where it is received again in a different way, can receive new meanings. And that's what happened. It's been interpreted as a great act of resolution, forgiveness, coming together, whatever word you want for that. Magnanimity, I guess, would also be a word. I don't think it meant that at all. And I don't think the way it was translated really affects that basic difference in interpretation. It's the capacity to do history that affects the interpretation. So for my final thing, how do we write history from the perspective of reception? It's got to be that capacity to see how and why messages are received, interpreted in one way or another. That affects their translation, but the translation is never the whole story. But also how and why they are received in other societies with other effects. And that difference, that difference between the modes of the reception has to be the historicity of translation. Thank you very much.